you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hello, hello. Welcome back to the show. I'm joined today by Dr. Leah Lees, also known as the Shameless Psychiatrist. She is a double board certified adult and child psychiatrist and assistant clinical professor at New York Medical College. She has a bustling practice in the Hamptons where she sees patients from all family arrangements. Her book called No Shame, Real Talk with Your Kids About Sex, Self-Confidence, and Healthy Relationships helps people pass down intergenerational wisdom instead of trauma by using modern psychotherapy techniques, which she perfected throughout her many years of experience. She is an expert in the field of psychology and hopes to change the way we speak about sex. Boom. All right. So today we discuss boundaries, consent, and shame around sexuality and our kids. We talk about the warning signs of sexual abuse and naming body parts correctly. We talk about gender identity, opposite gender role models, grounding children in community and coming of age rituals, and body positivity. There's a lot more in there too, as you can expect, but as always, stay tuned after for my final thoughts. Here's Dr. Lise. Hey, Dr. Lise, thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, you're very welcome. I have a lot of questions for you, um, but first and foremost, I want to ask you about this title of the shameless psychiatrist what is what does that mean to you and if you could tell me a little bit about what you do every day sure um well uh i'm dr leah Lees, and i'm known as the shameless psychiatrist because i help people take the blame and shame out of their game um <laughs> so you know i wrote a book no shame real talk with your kids about sex self-confidence and healthy relationships because i was just very tired of seeing so many kids in my practice i'm a you know, work with children forever, uh, experience so much shame and teenagers around their sexuality and developing and trying to figure out who they were going through puberty, you know, it's like this horrifying experience. And that led to a lot of, um, uh, trauma and trauma, traumatic experiences. So I figured, well, we can't trust the schools to do it because they do as you most schools do a, a completely terrible job. So we as parents have to be ready with our boxing gloves, getting out there and being proactive and realizing that, you know, as parents, we teach our kids how to hold a knife and fork and we take them to the dentists, we do all these things, but we leave them alone when it comes to one of the most important things I'll ever have to figure out. So mm -hmm. that's why I wrote the book and that's what I'm all about. Okay. So, so much there actually that I want to talk to you about. And, you know, when you mentioned your book I love the description of your book, and I have a lot of com like questions, I guess, based directly off of the description. So helping young children understand physical boundaries, like what does that mean? What do you want parents to know? What are what are we what are we missing or what mistakes are we making when it comes to this? Um, boundaries are. It's so important in psychiatry and psychology. I mean, they're the foundation of healthy relationships, you know, in marital relationships and friendships and, you know, in the negotiating sexual consent. I mean, we talk about boundaries all the time in, in, in my field, but like the lay per, average lay person almost never talks about it because they're mm -hmm. not educated about it. So, um, 
you know, I think women are more likely to experience the negative effects of shame um, because they were really never educated on how to say no or how to set appropriate boundaries when it comes to consent. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, women are always told from as soon as we can talk to please, like we have to please, we have to be nice, right? Mm-hmm. And that's that's a very antithetical to the idea of saying no. You know, like Mm -hmm. we're not nice if we say no, you know, like, and so what ends up happening is that, you know, we get bullied or pressured into doing things that we're, we don't want to do and don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And so then we develop uh, a lot of uh, fear around sex and, 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 you know, don't really embrace our power um, as women to express ourselves sexually and, and to really prioritize our pleasure. Mm -hmm. Um, So you know, my antidote, all this is like, it starts with the two and three, your children's age, learning how, I mean, to teaching them how to express their boundaries um, in terms of physical touch, which then can translate to sexual touch, sexualized touch. So um, a little kid, your children's age, what are the names of your children? Lucy and Wonka. Wonka Lucy, Lucy and Wonka, yeah. you know, you say, you know, if you're brushing their hair, you say, how does that feel? Am I doing it too hard? Am I, you know, you, you know, I, I, you know, yeah, I have to brush your hair, but if you don't like it, you can tell me and I can stop and then we can come back. You know, so it's this idea of like, or am I hugging you too hard? Or do you want a hug? Mm-hmm. You know, and then saying like, oh, if you want to touch one of your friends, put your arm around them, you should ask them first, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's already this idea of setting up you know, and I, I hate tickling. I, I'm a anti-tickling because, <laughs> you know, it's for it, unless your kid like asks to be tickled or you say, do you want me to tickle you? And they think it's funny. Great. But like this idea, you're going to, for- you're going to pull someone down and against their will tickle them is like the antithesis of everything I'm trying to tell parents to do. You know, it's like, they should want to touch and tickling is like this torturous thing for me. I hate being tickled. Yeah, and it's too. like, yeah. You know, and it's like, how do we do that to kids? It's totally the wrong message, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's this whole idea of like, you know, ba- you know, giving them the language to negotiate consent around physical touch. It starts very young. And then you start talking about sexualized touch, but that's, you know, eight, nine, 10, but you're like laying the foundation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Communication. I, yeah. I remember liking, you know, being tickled as a kid to some extent. And then there always came this point of like, okay, no, it's done now. Like I'm, I've reached a limit of uh, this isn't fun. And now as an adult, I can't stand it. Um, I just don't, just don't even try it. <laughs> I just, yeah. my husband thinks it's hysterical and I'm just like, ah! <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, I, you know, and I, the other thing I was thinking the whole time you were talking is even with my kids now, like you said, starting young, it's like. For me, what I really struggle with, because I've, I've heard this before with, you know, cons- basically even asking for consent to like brush hair or just like you said, is this okay? If you, know, you don't like it, we can come back, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I really struggle with wanting to have that type of dialogue with particularly my daughter, who's a little bit older and can actually communicate to me, but, and, and also just sometimes needing to get out the door. Like, it's like, oh my goodness, we just need to brush your hair. We just need to put your coat on. We just need to like do all the things to get out the door. (laughs) Like, and that's probably not your area of focus, but it's frustrating because I'm hearing myself being aggressive and I'm hearing myself being forceful about the activities that we're doing. And I'm, then I'm hearing in the back of my mind, something similar to what you just said and going, but we're late, you know, we just have to get to school and it's tough. It's, I just... I don't know. I don't know. It's not a question. It's just a vent. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, listen, to me. we're managing a lot of things as parents and as parents. And at the end of the day, you know, it's okay just to forego a tooth brushing moment or because you don't have the time or, you know, <laughs> the millions of times I've had to, you know, put my kid's hair in a bun and not, br- not right. brush it because I just can't deal with the, I don't have the time right. to sit there okay. and hear them scream and negotiate the consent. And so like, there's nothing wrong with skipping corners, um, cutting corners, but it's just, it's the idea of like having those teachable moments whenever you can, yeah. you know, and it's not going to be around everything. Okay. Um, and I also saying to them, you know, if you see your, like when I see one of my children slapping the butt of my other daughter, you know, one daughter, I always say like, 
you didn't ask, you know, your sister, if you could, you know, hit her like that. Like, you know, I don't, she didn't, you know, you, you can't do that. That's not okay. That's not, you know, touch in our family that, you know, you can do without asking. And so, you know, just communicate. You just, you just bring it up, you know? And yeah, I hear you. Okay. And then you mentioned to, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, trauma and things like that. And, and I, I just have this rational or irrational, I don't know anymore, um, fear of, fear of, you know, my kid being with other people and not knowing if something inappropriate is going on. Like, I I have no reason to think that, but whoever does, right? Like, that's Mm -hmm. exactly how these things happen is because you, you trust and you think, how could, how could someone mistreat my kid? And I guess I would ask you two things what's important for us to be talking to our kids about when it comes to abuse in that way and potentially what are some signs to look out for or, you know, warning signals of, Hey, something might not be right with this adult in their life. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that you need to protect your kids against sexual abuse by teaching them certain things and telling them certain things. So, for example, you know, naming their body parts correctly. So if at any mm-hmm. point you need to talk about, did, you know, did anyone touch you on your labia or your penis or your scrotum? They know what that means. And they're also more likely to be believed if, you know, by police or whatever they're ever assaulted. Um, you really need to lay out very clearly where the body parts are and who's allowed to touch them there. Right. So nobody mm-hmm. is allowed to touch your penis except for me, your dad, your doctor, and your, you know, nanny or whatever, like no one else is allowed to touch you there. And if they do, you have to tell me immediately, you know? And, and so, yeah. you know, they already know what's right and what's wrong touch, you know, and there's no, there's, and then you point exactly to the part, you know, this mm-hmm. is this, this is that, this is your scrotum. These are your nipples. These, you know, nobody's like, you know, so you can be very clear about it. Um, and then how do you, what are the war? I mean, of course there are, there are, are really a lot of, you know, scary things in this world. And, you know, what are the warning signs as a parent? Um, I think some amount of sexualized play is normal in children, but, you know, there is a tipping point where it's not normal, okay. you know, for example, they should not be touching another child's, you know, b- body parts, this, mm-hmm. you know, in a, any kind of sexualized way. And if, if they are, you know, they either saw it, or that, you know, uh, uh, pornography, or they were touching appropriately, um, uh, you know. It's right, because they shouldn't, they don't have, they shouldn't have that experience, right? Like they shouldn't, yes. the play is so modeled after what they experience, right? Like mm-hmm. playing babies or playing grocery store or whatever. And so, yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That and makes you sense. should be like, wait a second, why is, you know, why does this child, you know, grabbing someone else's genitals? Where do you, right. you know, you can, where did he learn that? Like what, what is, where where did that come from? And Mm -hmm. um, so that makes you question things. Right. Uh, And there's, there's other kind of like masturbation is totally normal and there's nothing, you know, you're born masturbating as far as I'm concerned and (laughs) and most kids. Um, And so that's because it's pleasurable. So that's normal, but like, you know, there are other things that are not normal um, in terms of um, what else have I seen? I mean, talking about, talking about uh talking about like saying to another kid i'll touch my penis you know or you know Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff like why you know that's the sentence of i would be uh, on red alert for um obviously um seeing anything any marks on the body that are you don't know where they're coming from things like that we question all right and and so you in your work every day you're working with mainly or only kids versus the parents Okay. So the younger they are, the more the parents are involved. So if they're younger than the age of five, um, it's about 75% parents, 25% kids between five and eight. It's 50, 50 between eight and 12. It's 75, 25 and over 12 is like 10%, 90 kid. I mean, you know, 90 is the kid. So just because it's the developmental stage is how involved because the parents become the therapist when they're very young. I see. Okay. And, and who, who is seeking you out? Like what's going on 
in life that they're saying, okay, we need to, we need to talk to Dr. Lee's. Oh gosh. I mean, everything you could think of, <laughs> anything <laughs> from divorce to bad wedding to, you know, to ADHD. Okay. So, it's, so I guess it's not, I'm just, what I'm getting at is it's not strictly, uh, strictly sexuality work. No. Okay. No. Okay. 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 Cause I, cause I was like thinking to myself, you know, cause I know that's a big part of your platform and your messaging. Right. So I'm like, how would someone even at say like six years old know that their kids needs to be working with a psychiatrist who specializes in sexuality? You know, that's where I was getting at. I'm like, how, what's yeah. going on here? No, <laughs> okay. I mean, I have okay. seen some cases where the issue is the sexuality, like, mm -hmm. um, it could be gender, you know, dysphoria. It could be, you know, acting out sexually inappropriately, or it could be, uh, lots. I mean, I have seen those as a referral, you know, Frank right. referral, but it's, it's not my, it's not like, but it's in the course of working with these kids on anything, depression, eating disorders that I am exposed to these issues on sexuality and, you know, develop that experience. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So, okay. So I'm going to go back to your book now, the importance of opposite sex role models. Yeah. What is the importance of opposite sex role models? Oh gosh, I love I love the idea of you know having an opposite sex role model when it comes to sex education. I think that what's something that's really lost in our society because you know the mom the mom says to the dad, "Talk to your son about sex," and the dad says, yeah. you know, and the dad's like horrified to ever talk to their daughter about sex. Like, oh my god, right. my little baby, she's gonna be a virgin till she dies. You know, and this whole <laughs> idea of like you know ever. Um, ever really embracing the power of that didactic, you know, the power of a father saying to a daughter, you need to prioritize your pleasure. And if any person partner touches you and it doesn't feel good, that's a red flag, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that person, it may not be the right relationship or maybe you're not ready. And that's mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, can you imagine if you heard that from your father as yeah. a girl, yeah. you know, what a powerful thing that would be. Yeah. And so, and you know, I think it's just like magical, you know, our, our mother being like, you know, you need to prioritize your partner's pleasure and you need to be asking and you got to make sure they have an orgasm before you even think about yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> wouldn't we, if that son grew up, wouldn't you want to marry that, that son, yeah, you know, because you'd be like, that mother is amazing. You know, yeah. so it's like this kind of role that these, <laughs> powerful, you know, influences. You can have that, you know, if you just give these messages. Yeah. And um, I think it's such a unique opportunity that we miss out on because, you know, even it, it drives me crazy that even at my kid's school, you know, they told me that they separate the genders to do sexual education on that. I, I was like, why? Like, right. I don't understand. Like, what's the mystery? Well, the boys get too embarrassed. I'm like, I don't really know. Poor okay. boys. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my like, God. Did you, did you just, like, swoosh us back, like, a hundred <laughs> years in that? Like, the poor like, boys. It must be really hard for boys out there right now. <laughs> like, I, I like, can't. Just, like, put the proverbial question box. I love that. That's right. really so great, you know, with yeah. the anonymous question box. Right. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, you know, it's this idea that we have to segregate the genders to talk about sexuality. We don't get it. And I don't think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually harmful. And so I, I, that's why I developed that idea um, about, you know, opposite sex role models. And if you're in a single sex household, you know, two women or two men raising children, then you find appropriate opposite gender role yeah. model, like uncles, aunts, friends. Why do you think, why do you think we're so intimidated by that? Like, what what is why are we why do we not do that why do we resist that and we need someone like you to be like hey this is good yeah you like know? yeah like you know yeah you know wake up call come right. on let's all talk about sex baby yeah. um why because of shame like it's all because of shame like shame causes avoidance mm -hmm. and we have all been shamed so much around our sexuality because of, I could give you the top ten reasons why we feel shame I mean um you, you mean know like three. Okay, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we feel shame because of media messages we get, you know, about our body and about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we get, we feel shame because of um, 
our parents passing down intergenerational trauma because they were shamed. It's a, they shame think things like masturbation is bad. You know, it's like, whoa, you know, um, to, to keep it lofty is like we forget to connect to our ancestors and the people who came before us. Like we are born to be sexual. We were born to do this. Like, and so if we just connect to the reality of that and be like, I love the fact that I'm sexual. I love the fact that I feel pleasure when I masturbate. You know, we can get rid of all that shame and then we can talk about it openly with our kids. Oh, and also this crazy idea that, you know, if we, if we talk about it, then our kids will do it. And yeah, like, I was just going to ask you about that because I've, I've heard that so often. Right. But, but we, and yet we have, but yeah, we have no problem talking to our kids about drugs and alcohol and, mm-hmm. and cigarettes. You know, yeah, we, like, we have whole dare mm-hmm. programs about it. Talk about it all day long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I don't, we don't yeah, expect don't kids that. to just go buy a pack of cigarettes after their dare program on, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just also this idea like, oh, well, if I – like, I think every parent should tell your kid when you're ready to have sex, you know, are you ready? First of all, ask. Like, mm-hmm. ask. If you ask, they might tell you. Are you ready to have sex? You know, are you thinking about it? No, I'm not ready. I don't – you know. Okay. So it when you are ready, what are you looking for? So that's mm-hmm. a great chance to talk about values. Well, I want to meet – a boyfriend and I want to feel like I can be in trust. I want to be in love, you know, but no, no, no. Oh, so cute. Like, great. That's a great, you know, well, have you thought about, you know, what kind of contraception you would use? Have you thought about what place you would do it in? Have you thought about what you want from that person the next day when you wake up, you know? Mm. Um, so those are the conversations and then, you know, come to me. And then when they come to you, you provide that safe space. And it's like, that's only going to delay sexual initiation because they're going to then be like, oh no, I'm not going to just go to some party, get drunk and have sex in the closet. Right. You know, I'm going to have to plan it out. I have to use birth control, and my mom, you know, and then yeah. you're going to delay it. Yeah. As you're talking, even I was like, gosh, it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> Like yeah. not on the part of the parent, but like putting myself in the position of the kid being like, geez, <laughs> yes, exactly. you're making yeah. them see it, the way, you yeah. know, see it through. And then you're, cause you're not saying no, yeah. you say no, all they'll do is just lie and do it anyway. Right. Right. Probably so, sooner without yeah. birth control. No, a party. Yeah. So, so a lot of this is, is about like, the, is a lot about the communication between the parent and the kid and, and really fostering that. And you know, you mentioned it again in your book, but it, it's tied to this. How how much do we tell our kids about our own experience and are there things that we should never tell them or always tell them or, or whatnot? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that avoid oversharing. Like at the end of the day, you're not their friend. Right. You have no <laughs> obligation to tell them about your own sex life or your own drug use, um, you know, both of those things. Um, you know, you don't, but, and also you can cause more damage by doing so if you don't do so thoughtfully, Mm -hmm. like, would you share with, if you were raped, would you share that with your child? I'm not saying don't ever do it, but you have to really think it through and decide whether or not you're sharing it for you or for them. You know, are you trying to scare them or are you Mm -hmm. trying to educate them? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't want to place them in the role of being a parent and having to comfort you because you were sexually traumatized. That's just mm-hmm. passing down your trauma. So, you know, you really have to think it through and decide whether or not it makes sense to share that. Um, but, and you're not obligated to, you don't, you, honesty is not, you know, you don't have to tell, <laughs> honesty is not always the best policy when it comes to parenting. Uh, not that you have to lie, but you don't have to tell them everything. Right. Um, if they ask you a direct question, right. you know, I don't really recommend lying. Like if your kid said to you, mom, did you ever use drugs? Or mom, did you have sex with before you were married? That's a direct question, you know, right. and fair enough. So then it's like, you know, you could, fair you enough. Know, <laughs> you <know. laughs> that, like, all right, giddy up. Here we go. <laughs> no, no, you yeah. Know? yeah. Then you can decide, you know, uh, how much do you want to share? And I do think it makes sense to say something like if you're ready to say it, you could be like, yes, I had sex before I was married and it was wonderful. And I really, you know, I took, you know, my first sexual experience very serious. It was a beautiful moment for me and I want the same for you. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, you know, it's not something I'm comfortable talking about, you know, Mm -hmm. because that's, you know, I'm your parent and this is my private business, 
you know, right. you can go either way with it, depending if you're ready, or you can be like, I'm gonna have to think about how I'm gonna answer that and get back to you. Those are all your options. Mm -hmm. um, don't you don't have to be like, and if your first sexual experience wasn't great, I wouldn't be like, oh, terrible, yeah, horrible. Right. You could be like, you know, I did have sex before I was really ready. And now looking back on it, I wish I waited for a little longer. And if I would, you know, this is what I would have changed. Mm -hmm. You could say, you know, there's always a way to spin it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like working on that, um, that, like, uh, like that, that, that initial reaction versus like yeah. avoiding the reaction, you know, and having a response. Is for, yeah. yeah. I think when it comes to parenting, you always sift the pearl out of everything. Like you, don't scare your kids, you know, don't be like, Oh, I was sexually assaulted. It was horrible. I men are hor you know, right. ter it's terrible experience. You have to be careful. Like, no, that's not the pearl. The pearl right. from your sexual assault is not that, you know, the pearl from your sex. And that's, you know, go get a therapist. If you want to do that, the pearl from your sexual assault is that, you know, to say to your kids, like I, you know, I had some sexual experiences that didn't go well and you know I learned a lot from them and what I realize now is you always have to keep yourself safe and these are the ways you can mm -hmm. that's yeah. the pearl yeah yeah oh yeah I know I guess I, I, I think about this sort of thing every now and then when I reflect on my own you know life and and how I was in high school into my 20s and this and that and if I and it I have to say, I was a pretty, it was a pretty like good kid. Like I it wasn't a big rule breaker and things like that. And I wasn't like super wild at any point, you know, <laughs> but I know that there were situations that if my parents knew about, they would, I, I can't even imagine being a parent knowing that like, even just walking home from bars at, at college at night. And yeah, I walked with other girls, but still we're three girls. Like, you know, it's just, it was things like that. It's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't know. We just have to, uh, it's just, it's scary. <laughs> I try not to think about it yet. I don't, but, but yeah, yeah. Just, I like what you said, the communication and, and framing it, not being like, wow, how, what an idiot I was for walking home from a bar in a miniskirt with three friends. It's like, okay, no, I yeah, wish I had been cognitive. smarter. Yeah. That's the cognitive reframing. And I talk about owning your sexual story in the book. And what I mean by that is like, you can only be a good parent if you're a good role model. And that's by owning your, owning your, your life history and your sexual story and passing down the pearls and the wisdom. And that's how you stop traumatizing and stop creating shame. It's like processing your own shame and what you would have done differently. Cause yeah. we're, none of us are perfect at all. And we all made a ton of mistakes and our kids will as well, but we just hope they don't make the game changer mistakes, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And I think if I had heard you say that, you know, even three months ago, I would have agreed and said, yes, of course, and a hundred percent. And, and actually in the last couple of like weeks, you know, we've kind of moved past it now, but in my own therapy, I really have just been going through my entire past sexual life. And because again, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have really thought there was anything super like that sticks out but when you get talking about it it's like oh yeah no that was kind of yeah I hated that or this wasn't great or that sticks with me or this like I I got emotional during the conversation I totally did not expect to and it was it was just it caught me so off guard and it, it made me realize how much I'll speak for myself I just push that whole phase obviously meaning phase of being sexually active with more than one person I'm married now but like I was just like out of I just pushed it away it was like got through it grinded it out okay got married met the guy like we're good now and I just totally forgot about it in a sense but but I guess what I'm saying is and I'll, I'll stop but it's like I guess what I'm saying is I really didn't forget it just I just really suppressed it yeah and yeah. for you, Christy, it's all about owning your own shame and, and, and your experience and experiences. So you can spin it and pass it down in a way that maybe your kids can do a little less, you know, a little better than you did right. or, <laughs> you know, and, right. and they can be happier. What we really want is for them to have happy, healthy, and, you know, pleasurable sex lives. I mean, we want that for them. We want them. And also, I mean, we haven't even broached the topic of, how sex leads to intimacy and how intimacy is so important. Um, and we want them to have intimate relationships. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot to think about, you oh know? My. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Now within, you know, sort of, so, sort of sticking with the sexuality, are you also versed in talking to talking to our kids or actually having the experience of working with kids who are experiencing or excuse me, exploring homosexuality, transgender, like what, how do we start these conversations? What is, I don't know, like go. Oh bit. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do have the opportunity and the experience working with kids who are, you know, of every, you know, feather. Um, and I absolutely love it. And, and in some ways they educate me because they are moving at a pace that I don't even, that boggles my mind in terms of the later teenage years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you know, how much they, how more, much more advanced in some ways than, than I am, even as a sexuality expert, uh, in this arena. But I will say that, um, a couple of pieces of advice I would give, you know, as a, as a parent to young children is to keep the gendered language out of the discussion about sex. So I say partner or mate. I know I don't say boyfriend, like to my daughters, I'll just say when I, sometimes I'll say when you meet your prince or princess, just kind of as a joke, but then I'll be like, when you meet your, you know, your, your, your first partner or your first mate or your first mm -hmm. love, I try to keep the gendered language out of it just because, you know, I don't want to make assumption or make them feel bad if they like totally. decide they're, you know, gay or homosexual. Like, so I'll just, I try to keep the gender and I would advise that as much as you can. I mean, listen, I'm, you know, I'm 45 years old, so it's, I'm not like so hip to the non-gendered pronouns, <laughs> like the young kids, it's very hard for me to do it, right. you know, but I try. <laughs> um, and the other thing is to just openly say when they're, you know, seven, eight, nine, like some, you know, some, you know, first of all, you could, even at your kid's age, you should start talking about how some people have two mommies and some people have two daddies. And these are the way babies are made. You know, if you have two mommies, this is how babies are made. If you have two daddies, this is how babies are made. You know, so biology is kind of already covered. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then it makes it easy to be like, someday when you grow up, you might, you know, feel love and romantic feelings for a boy, or you might feel love or romantic feelings for a girl, you know, so you already like have, you know, set all that foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, the discussion about gender identity is very confusing, you know, because it's just moving at such a fast pace that I can barely keep up with it. Um, but I have seen true gender dysphoria in many children and I do the best I can to help them be happy and comfortable in the bodies they've been given. But I also feel like if they just never will be, then, you know, they can explore other options and figure out how to, you know, be, be comfortable in whatever, you know, body makes, makes sense. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and just going back a, a minute to, you know, this is, if someone has two mommies, this is how babies are made. And if someone has a mommy and daddy, this is that like, and the way the rest of that conversation would be very just biological science based, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we're literally talking body parts. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's great books on it. Like it's not the stork, but like, you know, there are, <laughs> Right. You know, it, there. You know, if it's two mommies, you know, you need an egg and a sperm to make a baby. So if there's two mommies, it's two eggs, and you can't make a baby with two eggs. So you have to find someone, a man, to give the sperm, which is the seed, to the mommy, and so the mommy can make a baby. And it's mm -hmm. like, and that, you know, that's called in virtue of fertilization. You know, yeah. and then. <laughs> Right, right. I'm gonna have to give myself like a, a recap biology <laughs> lesson. <laughs> like, oh. yeah, it's embarrassing because I couldn't tell you all of the body parts by their name, and and I could, I just couldn't. I know I couldn't, and I know if I had to really explain it like that, I would stumble through it. Yeah, so there's great books. Like I always say, if you don't know what to say, there's been great psychologists who've written books on the <laughs> subject that you can just read, and therefore you know the right language. Okay. All right. And I mean, and so talking to kids about this, like what, what do you wish? I mean, we so you said that at your kid's school, you know, they have the kid, the boys and the girls separate for these types of conversations. And like, what do you wish they would do differently aside from that? Well, they didn't, I mean, my daughter is in uh, sixth grade and they didn't even start till sixth grade. I'm sort of like, what, you know, they right. need to start 
at age five, you know, mm. and that's the biology lessons, right? Um, mm. We just talked about how babies are made, just strict biology, you know, yeah. and then um, also start talking about who gets to touch you, which situation, when, where, you know, all the stuff that I'm talking about with you as a parent should be done in the schools. Yeah. Okay. And I got all this information from the Dutch curriculum, which is so much more advanced and they have lowest rate of STDs, you know, all that thing. They're like so oh. far ahead of us, you know, in every measure that, you know, that's why I think this is, this works. And they have such an interesting curriculum on love and intimacy in their schools that I mean, I find mind blowing, beautiful. And they talk about crushes from like six, <laughs> seven, eight. They talk about, you know, breakups, friendship breakups, how to handle it, how to cope with a breakup, friendship breakup, you know, yeah. romantic breakups. They talk about all this stuff in school and these kids are like so evolved. Yeah. I can <laughs> I mean, imagine. Yeah. Everything is better there. I'm like, you know, yeah. They're, it's like yeah. The because I, like, I remember people. having, yeah. I like, I remember having a significant crush in kindergarten. Like this isn't I remember his name. Like, it's not like, you know, yes. it's, it's, yeah. You and I've seen it with my niece. You're 12, and, you yeah. develop, no, you are hardwired from birth, Christy, to experience <laughs> love. That yeah. is totally uncoupled from sex. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. So I can Thank think God. of, a, yeah, well, I know. <laughs> and I, I can think of a few, but I, I want to hear from you. Like, at, what are down the line you know, some of the, the risks for the way that our system and our generalized societal view of this, like, what are the risks for these kids down the line? Risk of kid, like all kids or certain kids? Yeah, like, like just the fact that generally we're not in, in school, we're not, ha we don't have great education. Mm -hmm. Parents are still afraid to have these conversations. What are we setting them up for? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think that, uh, only half of adolescents have received formal instruction about contraception before they've had sex, which is horrifying, right? Okay. Um, that if a father is not present in the household, adolescent girls are more likely to have sex at an earlier age, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that if a teen identifies as, you know, um, homosexual, they're more, much more likely to be sexually assaulted or abused mm -hmm. or bullied. Um, so this is, this is what's already going on. And then, you know, what are they at risk for? It's like, you know, everything you can possibly imagine, sexual assault. And so it's like, we have to do better. It's, we have to do better, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and what I'm seeing now with the pandemic is that um, everything is being done online. So I'm seeing a real rise in this, um, sort of sexual fetishism and sort of, you know, this idea that we can get our sexual needs met through these kind of online odds like pornography or mm. furries or, you know, um, fetishism. And so it, it ob ob obliviates the need for actual in-person intimacy. And also people don't kind of get off on that anymore. Like, you know, good old fashioned sex because, you know, they've subverted it in so many ways. In... Yeah. yeah, that's terrifying. <laughs> like, only in the sense that, you know, I, the phones, the, the computers, the, the, all the re internet, all of it. Like, mm. I have, I have nieces and nephew and, and they're in their almost teens now. And, you know, they're on their phone and, and I, I have no idea. I'm their aunt. I'm not, you know, I'm not their parent. I'm not like, that's, I'm not that role, right? To be like, what are you doing? You know, but I'm looking at them and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, like what's going on on there? <laughs> you know, yeah. like even, even something seemingly more innocent and more approachable as like a TikTok or an Instagram or whatever. It's like, there's stuff on there. There's, well, there's yeah. images, there's videos, there's stuff on there that, there's a if real... you don't know what you're looking at, you mm -hmm. can certainly misinterpret what you're seeing. Of course, and and uh, there's been studies now that in, you know the Instagram files, and you've been hearing probably hearing about the media, you know, promoting children with uh, especially teen girls depression and body image issues, and you know, yeah. I think you know as as a psychiatrist and as a parent. Um, I think that social media is okay after the age of 13. I'm not, you know, don't tell parents. I don't think before 13, you, really, it should be 
none. Um, I do not think like an eight or nine year old girl needs to be on TikTok or any of them for that matter. You know, let's preserve some innocence here. But like at the age of 13 uh, and up, social media is not going to be detrimental unless, right, they already have a mental illness, like they're already depressed or they have an eating disorder and they're following like terrible, you know, influencers like pro Anna, they call them like anorexic girls, like doing terrible things themselves, which they do, by the way, I follow. Um, and it's horrifying. I thought um, we were past that. Like I thought this generation was so like not into the anorexic and body image thing. Like they were so just like, come as you are and everything's great. I mean, that's a gross generalization, obviously, but I'm shocked to hear that. Yeah, no, no. Because I'm, I'm I'm like, I'm millennial. I grew up with the you know, early 2000s of mm-hmm. stick skinny, super bulimia. <laughs> oh my God. Like Paris Hilton, all those girls yeah. that just couldn't be thinner. Yeah. And you don't really see that anymore as, as far as like, um, images, part, yeah. right. Part of like the public images and things like that. So I'm, I'm surprised about that. I really am. Yeah. I mean, it still exists. I think, uh, it, it's still pretty horrifying actually. And, but also a lot of other horrifying things like I'm seeing um cutting um mm. and the social media is I'm seeing a ton of cutting wow. and I'm seeing the social media's influence on that wow. wow so you know I think there is a lot of bad stuff on social media however it's also very dosage dependent it's like okay you can eat a piece of chocolate cake once a week and you're not going to get fat but if you have five slices of chocolate cake every day you're going to get something's gonna happen diabetes you know so like you you know if your kid is doing a half an hour to an hour a day of social media they're probably fine but if they're spending five hours a day social media like there's gonna be consequences so you know there is yeah yeah I know and I I I know I just feel for parents right now with kids that age because especially like you said like with a pandemic and now kids I mean we're so hopefully now more so out of it now but during that time where there was no other they're like what else are they gonna do <laughs> it's like they're just home this is the way they connect to their friends and you know there's that whole FOMO thing of like not knowing what's going on and not being involved and it's yeah it's a lot right on I yeah. know I agree yeah. I, I, it's not easy to be uh, it's not enviable to be a parent right now no. for you with your kids quarantined right now and you know for every parent who had to learn how to play the trumpet or whatever else we had to figure out during <laughs> Is that what you did? <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, it was tough and yeah. you know, we made it through. Yeah. I know. We're all we're all we're still standing well, here. You I and I, that. right? At least. I know. I know. I know. Well, and then I, I had a, a doctor's appointment yesterday where the woman was basically like there's nothing wrong with you. I think you're just tired and stressed. And I was like, oh, awesome. Great. <laughs> so we're still here. Great. <laughs> Thought I had yep. moved past this. She's like, no, not so much. And I, I, there's nothing medically wrong with you. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> My good body and, good and bad news, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then the other thing that, that we, um, I've been exploring and you touched upon it just a few minutes ago is is that connection, I guess, between body image and sexuality. Like if you have someone, a kid, you know, on these like pro Anna things or, or whatever, whatever example might be more fitting, um, for in your Your experience. Yeah. Your family or whatever, like, you know, it's, it's so connected, at least in my experience, in my own life of how I feel about my body and how I right behave sexually, on. it's really quite something. Even in my marriage, still, it's it's connected for me. Like if I'm feeling good or I'm not, you know, it's I don't know. And I, I you know, I think it's easy to talk about. Um, it's easier or more familiar for me to talk about the experiences it relates to, like being a woman and and how I think about my daughter. Um, what it. And I talk, I talk at nauseum about women and, and girls. So what, what do we, what do, in relate to, relation to that, boys, like what's going on for the boys that I wouldn't think of or that I wouldn't know about, or I'd be surprised I mean, to hear. We feel shame, boys and girls, um, when we, you know, put on a bathing suit or put on a 
you know, anything and we feel we're too tall or too short, Mm -hmm. you know, and and it's not even necessary for a disapproving person to be present. It's just, we internalize this narrative Mm -hmm. and, and from based on societal norms, like, you know, if a, if a boy is not tall enough, you know, Mm -hmm. I feel boys are, you know, tortured when they are scrawny, you know, small and on through puberty yet, or even if they're five, you know, grow in high school and they're five, six, you know, instead of six feet, they're just, they feel such shame about like things like that because they've internalized a man should be taller than his mate. Um, so, you know, my own personal story is the opposite. I'm six foot, two and a half. You can't tell on this Skype, but you know, I, you know, I grew up like horrified about my height, like just horrified, so much shame, so much shame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, you know, it's, it's men are not, you know, we're all, none of us are strangers to shame about our body. Um, and so it's like, okay, you know, we have to deal with that shame. We have to stop. We just have to learn to love the body that we have and realize that there's not that much we can do to change it. You know, yeah, you can lose a few pounds or whatever, but it's not, your body's not going to change that much, you know? Um, and we shouldn't expect it to. So, you know, that's about like, embracing and loving yourself so it, how do you do that like it's very hard makes mm-hmm. you know I if I'm, I'm you know I'm not your your specific therapist but what I will say is we can do better with our kids not to create shame for them so things like never denigrate your body you know in front of them mm-hmm. never say like I need to go on a diet I don't look you know I look bad or never denigrate your body mm-hmm. you know always talk and unpump your body up always talk about how beautiful your body is how great it you know how it allows you to dance and you know how wonderful it is to be a woman and how your breasts allow you to nurse and how beautiful that experience is and just pump it out just constantly you know talk I always tell my children you know it's hard growing up but I love being tall I can reach the highest shelf because I'll Mm -hmm. be tall too right so it's like always like I push myself up because they're listening and Mm -hmm. rather than saying you're so beautiful or you should love your body forget that just love your body in front of them yeah. That's how they learn. Yeah. But for particularly for boys too, it's like, you know, I like the idea of coming of age rituals for boys. I think they're really important. They do them in a lot of cultures. We do not, except for if you're Jewish, they have a bar mitzvah, but like there's not a lot of coming of age rituals in the American society. I think it's a real loss and it leads to a lot of body image and self-esteem issues because um, especially for young boys, I really believe that there should be more coming of age rituals. Like, you know, um, a group of men coming together and taking their teenage boy on a camping trip and talking about what it means to be a parent or a husband or a, you know, and just like, this is what is expected of you. And, you know, going out and, you know, sitting by the campfire and like letting him have its first beer and let him like, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever is in your family is into, you know, whether it be hunting or fishing or, you know, it's just having this experience in nature because nature grounds us and it reminds us what's important. Mm. So. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I, um, I hear that and it sounds wonderful, but I also think of men in my life who would hate, who it seems like they would hate something like that. <laughs> like not men, but the boys, like, is it about that experience or is it about saying to them what would be meaningful to you? Yeah. And, 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 and it's very family dependent. Yeah. Okay. You know, like whatever your family's into, you know, mm-hmm. great. I mean, if you can't, like, if it's a surfing trip, kids into that, fine. If it's a, you know, but it's just the whole idea of like getting that community of men together and charging them with the idea of speaking about what it means to be a man, okay. you know, yeah. like in society, you okay. know, like what is, what, it, what is it to be a responsible man in, in, in this family, in this community, okay. you know, what is expected of you and how can you do it in a way that like, you're a man, like you're a man now, this is what it means. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not to be too much about the gender thing, because I think majority of boys will become men you know I, if you're if you're if your child if you suspect your child might be transgender or something that I don't want to like get into that yeah. but I'm talking about the 99.9 percent of boys will grow up to be men and how you can ground ground them in a community of people who care and love them and those are their men role models in their lives yeah yeah and you know I was uh, I'm thinking we sort of do that as women more naturally without mm-hmm. it being this 
pronounced event, right, that's happening. We just have our moms, our grandmothers, our aunts sort of sitting around a table and that becomes that exact thing, right? Which is why I talk about it more for men because girl, like for example, when you get your first period, I mean, all your mom's going to sit you down and be like, you're a woman now. This is what it means. Oh, I'm a little crying and whatever. And they get these. And I do think that should also be expanded and elaborated. Um, I, uh, you know, for my children, I'm going to do a full moon ritual. So after their first menstrual period, I'm going to get a group of women together and we're going to talk about being a woman and they're going to be horrified and probably looking at the floor, but they will always remember it. You know, yeah. and they will always keep it with them. Right. And then we're going to do like a, a each, you know, woman's going to give my child a token, like something like a journal or a photograph or like, an ex, you know, a letter or something from their experience about being a woman. And I think that's going to be a beautiful ceremony. But I really encourage men to do it as well. Um, and I yeah. think it, it will, if you want to know how do you create a child as good self-esteem and good body image, this is how. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny just for for me this is a totally on, on my end. I, you know, hearing you talk about it in what you're planning to do. And as women, I'm totally like a hundred percent. Yes. All on board hearing about it uh, from the male point of view of the men. It's, I was a little like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Hearing what it is sort of just out loud as, as from the female side, it was like, Oh, well, yes, no, they can do that. Like, I don't know. I just have this like, um, I think I ha I have a little bit I have a, of like a I don't know if it's jaded is the right word or what of like just this like little chip still about like well we have like enough men being men in the world you know what I'm saying <laughs> like it just was like can we make men can we have a sit down a powwow with men and be like well this is how we were men but here's how you could do it a little bit better <laughs> do you know what I'm saying <laughs> like I'm just like I don't know I guess that's like I said that's yeah. on me <laughs> but I just well, yeah, like, I mean, uh, obviously you're bringing your own personal narrative into yeah, it. Yeah, I like, know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about bros before hoes. You know, I know, I know, about. I know. But I think it's important to clarify. I think it's important to say really what what we hope to get out of it. Because when you talk about it from your girls, I could totally, I can see it. I can feel it. I can hear it. I can put myself in that situation and I can love every second of it. And then, you know, I just think it's, it is important, at least for me, to clarify you know, sort of, yeah, it's not this boys, boys will be boys sort of situation. No, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it has to be. So I talk about in the book, like, you know, you kind of set out the, the paradigms of what you want to discuss in these coming of age rituals. So it's like what it means to nurture, mm, uh, okay, like the next generation as a man, what it means to provide. So how, you know, what is that? What does it mean to be a provider? What does it mean to be a nurturer? What does it mean to be a, um, a, um, uh, a member of your community, mm -hmm. right. And what it, what it also means to be a romantic partner. Yeah. So there's like four pillars of the coming of age ritual that I think should be discussed amongst the men. Okay. And, you know, this is not meant to be a joke. Like I hope men will take it seriously and see it for what it is. Like this right. is a, an amazing coming of age ritual. Right. Um, and it can be done in a way that is fun, like a camping trip or a surfing trip or a, even if it's just a guy's night, you know, in yeah. a, someone's living room, you know, right. and it's sort of like, I mean, it is a little weird because it's so unfamiliar, yeah. but it has been done in every culture besides the American culture yeah, or European culture very successfully in many African cultures. And they do these coming of age rituals mm -hmm. and they are really largely successful mm -hmm. in creating um, community. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just going to, I'm going to push it one more time because I have to fully process it for myself now, but, and it's using those pillars. That's where we differentiate from, you know, saying things like men run the household and women are not our equal. Like we, we, that's where we're going to say those things. Like that's not how it is anymore. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know. I'm like very concerned about this right now. <laughs> I mean, you got to trust that, you know, if you, you got to trust that the men that are raising your son are going to understand those things, you yeah. know, otherwise, why did you yeah. marry that person? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. yeah. A guy you don't trust? No, totally. I know. No, I, I, and I, yes. I, well, so now I have to say this. I do trust my husband and my men in my life. I think I just have this like 
broader picture of like now of just I don't know I'm I'm taking it too far deep now I think but um but I do I think no matter what I think that encouraging boys teenagers that identify as as men as boys encouraging them to talk is I think probably really what we're getting at and getting mm-hmm. that that it's okay to share emotion and share experience because we've really really made it such that that's hard for them to feel comfortable doing yeah exactly and talking about what it means to be an adult and and to be responsible adult yeah and I also talk about in the book like you can give the boy a task you know like if you know if if it's about nurturing then let them babysit a younger child (laughs) oh interesting yeah and if you're talking about responsibility, then you say you have to use your hard-earned money to buy something for our house, like a toaster, you know, right. or a, and then, you know, when I talk, when you're talking about, you know, sexual um, development, then, you know, I want you to read a book about, you know, uh, about, you know, sexual development and what it means to get consent. And yeah. then, you know, the fourth, you know, so you get sort of home assignments in every pillar and then you come around and sort of talk about it as a group of men. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Listen, you know, if your family is the kind of family that views women as, <laughs> you know, staying home and right. being, you know, I inferior, know. you're going to pass that down no matter what. I totally like my anxiety just took that and like ran with yeah. it. <laughs> So, it was on me. You're kind of sitting, being sitting around on your drum circle with a bunch of men talking about <laughs> how women should cook and you should, you know, earn money. That's your family values. You're passing that down no matter what. True, true, true. Okay, okay. I can breathe again. Um, <laughs> is there anything about the work you do, whether it's in your private practice or as far as, um, you know, sort of being this this public figure with a stance? that surprises you anything that like just catches you off guard every now and then oh yeah so many things right so many things catch me off guard like um how much more teenagers know about things that I do at times you know mm-hmm. and how they can totally school me and I'm like damn yeah, yeah <laughs> that catches me off guard uh what else catches me off guard um uh parents who are unwilling to talk to their children about sex there are many you know, because they want to preserve their innocence. It, to me, it's always shocking because I'm always like, uh, oh did you have sex before you were married? So, yeah, well, yeah, but I was bad. <laughs> They're just innocent. I'm like, okay. Um, it just I, it just doesn't – I just doesn't resonate with me at all how people, like, people could have such ostrich syndrome, um, you know, burying their head in the sand. Mm. Uh, what else surprises me? Um well, I guess those are some things I could probably think of more things, but yeah. Yeah. One last thing I want to say is also like these discussions as scary as they are, are awesome because when you do them and your kid comes to you and says, you know, mom, I met this, this, this person and I'm in love and I think I'm ready to have sex. And you're like, ah! you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, ah! You know, but you know, that's on the inside. Right. <laughs> and the outside right. is like, oh my God, how amazing. Right. Wow. You know, then they do it and they come back to you and they say, Mom, I had sex. It was so great. Oh, baby, I hugged. You know, and it's like, right. it's like oh, I've been so in love. Right, right, right. It's so amazing. <laughs> You're just like laughing because you know, like, you know, yeah. And then you give your kid a hug and like, what a moment. Like, yeah. As a parent, it's like yep. an Oscar award winning <laughs> parenting moment. Yeah. And you should yeah. have it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Because otherwise, like you said, they're going to do it and then you're going to find out about it like a decade later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Dr. Elise, is there anything that you would have asked yourself that I didn't think to or anything you want to really make sure we get into this into this conversation? Yeah, no, I, I can't think of anything else important, but I just say get out there, get your Academy Award, you know, <laughs> yeah, you got like young that. kids, you're like at the, you know, you're gonna have so much fun. It's it's so fun. It's so much fun. You act 
when I talk to kids about sex, I love it. It's so fun because their perspective is so fun and it brings me back to my childhood. And I remember what it was like. And I say, nobody loves like a teenager. I'm like, nobody loves like a teenager. And just, you know, it's like going to Disney world with your kid and experiencing it through their eyes. It's amazing. Go there, have fun, enjoy it. It's not all hard. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. You've given me a lot to think about with these little babies. It's, yeah, it's a lot. And it's it's an area in particular. I mean, I don't know that there's any area that you want to sort of take lightly, but it's certainly an, an area of particular attention to me because I think, I don't know, I, I think for a lot of obvious reasons, but also just having that experience as a woman growing up in a time where it wasn't so openly talked about. And I had okay experiences. I'm okay, you know, but... Just like you said, wanting to do it a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, I'll link your book. I I mentioned it a lot. I'll link your book in the show notes. I'm going to grab a copy. So thank you. Yeah. No shame. Real talk with your kids about sex, self-confidence, and healthy relationships. Check it out. And my website's great too. Shamelesspsychiatrist.com. A ton of uh, new articles and stuff on parenting. Awesome. Thank you. Whenever I think of Dr. Lise or see her handle on Instagram or see an email from her come through, I immediately hear in my head, let's talk about sex, baby. (laughs) And something tells me that she probably loves that. All right, so I think it's pretty obvious the value and importance of having open communication and shameless conversations around sexuality, sexual identity, and relationships with our kids. But what I hope you really got out of this conversation, as I did, is how to do that and how to begin the process in age-appropriate ways. You know, recently in my state of New Jersey, sexual education in schools has been a very hot topic of discussion. And while I'm not here to solve anything, knowing what I know now from Dr. Lease and previous guest Melissa Donahue, it does seem that reform is needed across the board. Sex is a normal part of life. Yes, adult life, But they both talk about how with kids, we can start with the simple biology of our bodies and the functions. You know, I think it was Dr. Lee that gave the example of when we talk to a kid about a shoulder, we tell them how it works and why, why it does what it needs to do. You know, the same should be said for body parts, all the, all the body parts, right? Anyway, it also feels like to me that Eventually, this will be a topic that will wonder why any of this was ever up for debate. I hope. I hope that these conversations start to feel more comfortable and normal. And because what's really coming through for me on all of these conversations that I'm having with experts in sex is that the discomfort and the shame and just sort of the immediate tense up that we all do when someone mentions sex especially when it has to do with our kids seems to be one of the biggest problems it's not and I look I, I'm, I'm not to say there aren't horrible and inappropriate things out there happening that need to be addressed they do I think what they're trying to tell us though is that on a regular basis in and out of our homes in schools that talking to our kids about this in a meaningful way, talking to our kids about it in a comfortable way and in a safe, loving environment is way more beneficial than making it out to be this awkward, scary thing because it's a normal part of life. I don't know. It really makes me think. And ultimately, I hope that's what it does for you too. It makes you think. In the meantime, grab a copy of Dr. Lee's book to learn more. And that's all I got for today. So thank you, Dr. Lee, and thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Sass Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sasssays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later.